and welcome to episode number four of Throwing Bagels. Uh, I'm Kevin Mooney. Thank you so much for joining us. And we are, as always, joined by Chris Douglas. Hey, Chris. Good afternoon, evening. How's everyone doing? Or whenever you're listening to this podcast. I, I know, say. whenever. And uh, Jay Hamo. Hey, Jay. Hello there, everybody. We have a, a really special guest uh, uh, joining us uh, for this edition of Throwing Bagels. So we'll we'll get right to it. Um, he is the radio voice of the Houston Astros, is now entering his 11th season as a voice of the Astros, a Bronx native. And we're going to talk about all this Bronx native SU grad, uh, also one time broadcaster for the Binghamton Mets. So uh, please, it's our honor uh, and privilege to welcome in Robert Ford. Robert, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, guys. We understand recently you were named uh, 2022 Texas Sportscaster of the Year by the National Sports Media Association. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I mean, what was your reaction when they they told you you won? Well, I kind of had an inkling it was coming um, because, you know, they they announced the finalists for it. um, I guess it was November, like maybe before Thanksgiving and the guy who runs that organization, he's friends with one of my former professors at Syracuse, who I still keep in touch with. Um, for that professor is now retired. But yeah, he texted me out of the blue. We talk from time to time, but he texted me uh, out of the blue and was like, hey, can I give this guy your phone number? And so when he told him, when he said that, I was like, okay, well, this guy's probably going to call me and give me some sort of an award here. Um, but yeah, it was still it was still very much an honor. And um you know, there are a lot of, I mean, there are a lot of great broadcasters everywhere. Texas is no exception. Um, and Texas, I mean, Texas is a pretty big state. So uh, to be to be named uh, Sportscaster of the Year for Texas is uh, is pretty cool. No, definitely. And uh, uh, speaking of, of the Astros, uh, there's a lot uh, going on in, in Houston. We're a week or so away from, as we speak, uh, we're about a week away from pitchers and catchers, which is always a great time of year uh, for baseball fans. About a couple of weeks or so ago, the Astros announced the hiring of Dana Brown as their next general manager. Great, terrific track record with the Braves. Uh, Drafted uh, Michael Harris, Spencer Strider, has had 20-plus years of experience in MLB front offices. I mean, how how great of a hire is that for the Astros? I mean, it seems fantastic. Um, Everything I've heard has has been very good, very positive. I've yet to meet him. I I, I will down down at spring training. It'll probably be the first chance I get a I get to talk to Dana, but um, yeah, I mean, you got to like the track record. It kind of makes you wonder when you look at his background, why he wasn't a general manager sooner. Um, I know he had interviewed for jobs in the past, but yeah, really happy to have him in Houston and I'm looking forward to seeing what he can do and, and, and getting to know him. Sure. And with, with Brown's hiring, he, he becomes uh, at, at this point, the, uh, the only black general manager in baseball. And we know it's been in the news about how, MLB is trying to introduce more diversity, both on the field and in the front office. Uh, how, how do you think the the efforts have been going t- toward making Major League Baseball more diverse? Well, I mean, I, I think these things take time. Uh, I think there are a lot of a lot of good things that are happening that that can potentially bear fruit down the road. But I think when you look at where things are now, I think it's the result of the fact that there really wasn't much done to try and diversify major league baseball in the past, um, you know, for, for a long time, because sometimes you have to do, you have to have these grassroots things going for, in some cases, 20, 30 years before you really see it bear substantial fruit. When you think about the uh, youth academies, uh, the RBI program that major league baseball has, the Astros have a youth academy that's part of the RBI program, um, you know, in the acres home, the neighborhood of Houston, which is, uh, you know, a, a historically black area of Houston, um, not exactly the wealthiest part of town. Um, and those kids get to play baseball and softball and get top level instruction for nothing. And they also get tutoring and, and homework help. And I know that this, this sort of thing happens at many of the other academies around the United States, but stuff like that, you know, that, that takes time. Like, you, you know, yeah. for example, just using the, the RBI program and the youth Academy program as an example, uh, Malachi Moore was just named a full-time umpire uh, for Major League Baseball. He had been a full-in fill in umpire for the last few years. Malachi Moore is from Compton. And um, Kerwin Danley, who recently retired um, as an umpire, 
uh, spotted Malachi Moore helping out at the Youth Academy in Compton and basically encouraged him to get into umpiring. Malachi Moore was a junior college baseball player. And Kerwin Daly even said to me, he's like, dude, you're not even starting on your junior college team. Like, what are you doing? Why don't you consider a different path here? Like, you know, um, and so, you know, now Malachi Moore is a big league umpire, full-time big league umpire. So, but that, you know, that took time. And I know there are some guys out of the Astros Youth Academy who are umpiring in the, in the lower minors, you know, th- those things take time. So that's just one example. Uh, so I think there are a lot of good things that are happening. Um, I think the first part of, of trying to fix something is being aware that there's a problem that needs to be fixed. And I think uh, there are a lot of people in Major League Baseball who understand that. Mm-hmm. And so now the next step is to put these initiatives in place and, and be patient and, and have them bear some fruit. Let's make you the commissioner of baseball. Is there anything <laughs> Please you <don't>. would? <laughs> is there anything that you would uh, do differently or enhance uh, to to promote more diversity in the game? I think what you need is diversity at all different phases of baseball. I think you know there's a lot of attention paid to the dearth of African American baseball players, especially compared to the number, the percentage of African-American ballplayers in the big leagues, you know, as recently as 30, 40 years ago, Um, which, I mean, that may sound like a long time, but that's really not that long ago. Mm -hmm. You're talking a generation and a half, two generations ago. Um, But you also have to look at the front offices. You also have to look at a lot of the behind the scenes stuff on television. You know, the people in the production crews, uh, in addition to the people who are on air, I think, that there needs to be an effort to diversify in all areas uh, when you're talking about sports in general. I mean, specifically, we're talking about baseball here. But I mean, even, you know, when you when you think about, for example, people who work on production crews of, of baseball games that produce baseball games that are on TV, if you talk to most of them, most of them work locally, like the camera guys and the stage managers, they work on visiting uh, broadcasts, they work on home broadcasts. You ask most of them how they got into it. They'll tell you that, you know, oh, my dad used to do this. Or, um, you know, there was a guy in my neighborhood who used to do this stuff. And I was friends. I was friends with his son. And he was like, hey, why don't you just come down to the ballpark with me one day? And, you know, I can show you a few things. That's how a lot of that. I mean, I mean, when you think about how a lot of us got into whatever jobs we've gotten into, a lot of times that's how it starts. A neighbor, an uncle, an aunt, a friend, you know, and so. I think, and, you know, just to even make people aware that that's a possibility, like, oh, I could be a stage manager on a TV broadcast. Well, what exactly is that? What does that mean? What does that entail? Is this something I'd like to do? You know, I think just that awareness is important or, oh, wait, you work in marketing for a major league baseball team. What's that all about? You know, and I mean, I think that's, that's, that's the biggest piece to me in order to um, really get more diversity. Um, And I think regardless of how you feel about, how diverse baseball is right now. I think if you are someone who loves baseball, if you're a big baseball fan, if you want baseball to continue to be one of the top sports in America, you should want diversity because the only way for baseball to stay where it's at and not become a niche sport like soccer is in this country or or really hockey is in the United States, you need that diversity. You need people from not just, you know, white suburbia, who are into baseball. You need kids in the inner city. You need, um, you know, women. You need Asian. You know, I mean, you, you just, I mean, you know, every you think about just how diverse the United States is. And I think for baseball to continue to be one of the top sports in America, it needs to reflect that diversity on and off the field. And Robert, how how big is it, do you feel like, Right. Dusty Baker is the manager of, of the of the Astros. Now you have Dana Brown, who's the general manager of the Astros, right? And you're yourself, right? The broadcaster for the Astros. The the, the black community can say we, we we can look at multiple different people, right? And say, I can do this when I grow up. I can be a manager, I can be a general manager, I can be a broadcaster, right? How how big do you think that is for you know people for kids growing up today to say I can do many different things? Like I can't I don't have to just be a baseball player. I think that's that's huge. Um, and it. I think just the presence is big. I mean, even if you don't go beyond that, I mean, yes, it's nice to go into those communities and, and talk to kids and things like that. But even just 
you know, you flip on the TV and there's an Astros game and you li- they, they have a shot at Dusty Baker in the dugout, dugout and you're a black kid and you're like, oh, they, their manager looks like me. Um, mm-hmm. And maybe you don't think that consciously, but at least it's not a situation where it's like, man, there's nobody out there that looks like me. Why would I, why would I even be interested in this? Um, I mean, I had a lot of people, especially when I was starting out in the minor leagues, who would ask me, you know, how did you get into this? Like, why do you like baseball? Like, like black people asking me this, like baseball, like that's not a, you know, and you know, then that's a chance for me to educate them about how, you know, it wasn't always this way. And, you know, I have a grandfather who's, you know, was the biggest Mets fan on the planet and played briefly in uh, a minor league of the Negro leagues and, you know, all of those things and how there was a time when baseball was the sport in America period, but especially in black America. So um, I think just being that presence and people just knowing like, oh, this is, you do this. Okay. All right. So this is, this is clearly something that's not just for certain people. And I think we all consciously as adults know that, but it's one thing to know that intellectually. And it's another thing to actually see that. Just throwing in, I mean, there have been countless studies done, uh, scientific studies that have shown that companies in general that are more, the, as the companies grow more diverse, they grow more successful. And so that that same application can be given to, to Major League Baseball and to, and to other professional sporting leagues. If you want to guarantee uh, a successful run uh, or continued success or even improved success for an organization, it's important to really uh, focus it on diversity and, and try to enhance it as much as possible. Well, and here's another part of it too. Um, I think for those of us who cover the game, I think it's a lot of it, not just who cover the game, but in baseball, just having different perspectives. Yeah. Um, I love talking with um, re- uh, the Japanese reporters or the uh, reporters from Latin America um, because they have insight and knowledge about what those players have gone through that I'm just not going to have because I'm not from Latin America. I'm not from Japan. I'm not from Korea. And so it's always fascinating. I learned so much just talking with them about just kind of, you know, what these guys have gone through and just kind of what the expectations are, or even just learning about like, you know, with Shohei Otani, for instance, and, you know, the Astros get to see a lot of them being in the American League West, but you know, about, you know, talking, there's a, a woman that I know who's of Japanese descent. She's, she's from California and she works for NHK, um, which is the uh, Japanese television network that broadcasts. They broadcast like 200 baseball games a year and not all of them just with Japanese players, but that's obviously their main focus. But she was telling me once that they have a camera on Shohei Otani at all times. So it's like up in the corner of the screen, like in the upper right corner of the screen, like Shotani, you know, he's just chilling in the dugout. There's a camera on him at all times. And when you're <laughs> watching the game, you always know what Shohei Otani is doing. And she told me that he's only the second player they've ever done that for. Ichiro was the other. Like, I mean, yeah. that just gives you an idea. Like when you think about, you know, hey, this is, this is a lot different for Shohei Otani than it is for, say, Mike Trout. You know, there's not a... This, you know, the Angels games aren't being beamed back to New Jersey with a little camera shot of Mike Trout, you know, <laughs> in the corner, every, you know, every his every move is as popular and as great as he is. So, you know, just learning stuff like that. And, you know, this offseason, I've actually, um, you know, I, I already kind of knew a little bit of Spanish, but not fluent and still not. But I took Spanish classes because I want to um, be able to communicate better um, in the native language of a lot of the, the players and coaches in Major League Baseball. We will segue awkwardly to a totally different topic. (laughs) Uh, Carlos Beltran's been in the news a little bit lately. Um, He was recently hired by the Mets to be in the front office. Uh, And there was an article recently by uh, Mr. Nightingale that uh, uh, USA Today, where perhaps he's saying enough is enough. Let's get this guy into the Hall of Fame. Is what happened with the Astros holding him back? I mean, is that something that's actually happening? I don't think so. I well, I, I don't think so, but I also think it, it's probably too early to tell. This was his first year on the ballot, and I think you could argue that he was a borderline candidate to begin with. And obviously, his association with uh, the Astros cheating scandal doesn't help him. Uh, I tend to believe that he will get in, and I tend to believe that the writers will vote him in. But I think over the next several years, we'll have a better idea of you know how much 
the sign stealing scandal and Beltron's involvement in it. Um, because again, he was the only player named in, in the commissioner's report. So I think that's a, that's a big part of it there. I mean, it's not like, you know, if somebody else who was on the 2017 Astros is up for the hall of fame, a position player, that it's going to affect them in the same way that it affects Beltron. Um, like it obviously won't affect Justin Verlander. I mean, I think that's safe to say being a pitcher and all that. Um, and also just the, by his body of work, but, I think, yeah, it's going to be interesting, but I tend to believe that that won't outweigh everything else that he did in his career. And I think it's different than the guys who have been connected to performance enhancing drugs, because I think with those guys, there is in some cases knowledge, in some cases a presumption that this was something they did for a number of years over the course of their career. Whereas with the sign stealing scandal with Beltron, that was his last big league season, as far as we know. I mean, that was the only year that he was with the Astros, at least in his second stint. Of course, he was with them, um, you know, had that great 2004 run with the Astros coming over um, in a trade. But, uh, you know, that was the only year of his career. It was the last year of his career. He didn't put up particularly great numbers. That year probably wasn't going to uh, enhance his Hall of Fame candidacy anyway. Uh, so I tend to believe that that Carlos Beltran is, is going to get into the Hall of Fame. I think the writers will vote him in. Um, and if not, he definitely will get in with the Veterans Committee. But I, I tend to believe that uh, at some point he'll he'll get in. But he was I don't think he was ever going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer. Uh, you mentioned, mentioned uh, Justin Verlander. What can the Mets expect from him this year? Well, the guy was really good. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, the thing about Verlander, it's easy to be like, well, you know, he's approaching 40 and all of these things, but it's just so hard to count him out considering his body of work. And, you know, he had that period where he had the core injuries or whatever with Detroit, where he kind of fell off a little bit. But then, you know, his last couple of years or so with Detroit was outstanding, then comes over to the Astros. Helps them win a World Series, um, helps them win two World Series, as it turns out. Um, And then, you know, had Tommy John surgery, um, you know, like, and I I forget the exact numbers, but like, he's like one of the oldest guys ever to come back from Tommy John surgery, particularly as a starting pitcher and and be successful. Um, And, you know, he comes back from Tommy John surgery. And wins a Cy Young Award. I mean, Insane. it's, you know, I, I get the whole, yeah, you know, you always have to worry. The same thing with Max Scherzer. You know, you're getting up there in age. You always have to worry about, okay, are these guys going to be able to make, you know, 30 starts every year? Are they going to be able to continue to be effective, you know, deep into October where, you know, you're obviously hoping that, you know, if you're a Mets fan, that, that they're still playing at that point. Um you know, I get all those questions, but I think with Verlander and Scherzer, too, because of their body of work and because they've defied all odds, I mean, I think it's clear that they're outliers. And, mm-hmm. yeah, I think the, the Mets can expect another another excellent season. I mean, is he what he was, you know, in his prime with Detroit? No, but he's still really good. Going back to the Astros really quick uh, and, and the whole, um, you know, cheating scandal and whatnot, uh, Alex Cora had a quote uh, in a book written by Evan Drellick. Uh, winning fixes everything. And uh, I'll read the quote here. He says, we stole that bleeping World Series. Was it really necessary for him to say that? We kind of already do that, didn't we? I mean, it probably wasn't the best idea <laughs> to <laughs> say that. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it's so interesting, you know, on so many levels, everything that has transpired with the, with the whole cheating scandal, not just with act, the actual act, but also just kind of, the way the fallout has been, you know, since, um, because I think what makes it so tricky is there's so, so much gray area. So look, the 2017 Astros, you know, a really good baseball team. They won uh, 101 games and you can bang trash cans or do whatever you want. All you want. You don't win 101 games unless you're really good. hundred percent. Um, so there's that. There's also the fact that, um, you know, they were like historic how good they were on the road. They were much better offensively on the road than they were at home. Like at one point, they were trending to be the best offense on the road in baseball since like the 1930s Yankees teams. 
you know, during the Great Depression when nobody had any money and the Yankees had all the stars and the Yankees would just go to your town and just, you know, just bludgeon you to death. You know, they weren't winning all those games on the road because they were doing, you know, because of nefarious things. So there's 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 that. And then there's, you know, Yankees fans like to talk about the ALCS. Dodgers fans like to talk about the World Series. And in both cases, you know, the Yankees scored three runs in the four home games that the Astros played in the World Series. So you can say, well, yeah, the Astros cheated and whatever, but the Yankees also didn't score any runs. And, you know, with the Dodgers, you could be like, well, you know, the Astros won two games in L.A. and um, they won game seven in L.A. So, you know, there are all these there's there's all that stuff. But then there's also the fact that, hey, this does give you an advantage. I mean, I think it's obvious, but how much of an advantage is it? It's so hard to measure. You can't measure it, you know. And so does that mean that everything's invalid? I don't think it does. I mean, yeah, I get that there's always going to be a question about the 2017 Astros. I understand that. I don't know that you can say with 100% certainty that, you know, they stole a World Series or they stole a division title or they stole a tenant. Or, I think that's really hard to do, but there are always going to be questions. It's just the way it is. Um, I don't think that's ever going to go away uh, for, for that group. Do you think they've been vindicated since they won another World Series since then? You know, that's a good question. I think one thing to keep in mind, there are only five guys that were on the 2017 Astros that were also on the 2022 Astros. And two of them were pitchers. So... You know, you take out Justin Verlander and Lance McCullers Jr., you have Yuli Gurriel, Jose Altuve, and Alex Bregman. Three position players were still on the 2022 Astros that were part of the 2017 club. So, I mean, it, it really was a completely different roster. I know it may not feel that way, but it, it was. And so I think from a player standpoint, at least just from what I could tell, uh, being around the team, and then you throw in the fact it's a different manager, um, you know, you mentioned Alex Cora, who was the bench coach in 2017. He isn't on the staff. Those various factors, I think for our, for the players, they wanted to win a World Series because they want to win a World Series. That's why you play. Sure. Right. And this, this, you know, you know, they're motivated by that. I think for the Astros fans, it felt vindicating for them, for sure. I think the fans wanted this um, not only for that reason, but I think that was a big part of it, like, Oh, you can't say anything now because they won in 2022. Of course, then other fans could argue, well, there are only five players from the, you know, it's, right. you know, but um, yeah, I think, um, I think definitely for the Astros fan base, fan base, they feel like there was some vindication uh, for the Astros winning again. And then also throwing the fact, not only did they, they won another world series, uh, you know, five years later, but they had gone to other times in the interim and, you know, lost in seven games to the Nationals and the really world, world, weird, weird World Series in 2019 where the road team won every game. And, um, you know, the Braves team in, in 2021 probably was, you know, pitched better than the Astros, uh, certainly better than I thought they would against the Astros. And, you know, well, I think the Astros had two home runs in that World Series and both of them were hit by Altuve. And the Braves outplayed them. Um, you know, so you have those two World Series in the interim. So I think for our fan base, a lot of it was, you know, it felt like vindication and also like, you know, I think a lot of our fans were probably like, hey, you know, it'd be nice to see them win another one of these things after, you know, being in two others and losing them. <laughs> one quick question about the 2022 playoff run. The, the series against the Mariners, was that not one of the wildest uh, series you've ever encountered? <laughs> you know, it kind of gets swept under the rug because, you know, then the Astros play the Yankees again and they sweep them and you know, the, the, you know, the Astros and Yankees have become kind of a rivalry in the American League the last few years. And then, you know, obviously then the World Series against the Phillies. But, you know, that division series, I mean, that could have gone very differently than it did. The Mariners were coming off an epic win over Toronto in the wild card round when, you know, they were down by, you know, five or six runs, whatever it was, and came back and won um, to advance. It was their first playoff appearance in 21 years. Game three of the ALDS was their first home playoff game in 21 years. And, you know, game one, obviously, you know, the Astros were were down for most of the game, down by three, four runs most of the game. And, you know, next thing you know, Jordan Alvarez hits a, a walk-off home run in the bottom of the ninth inning, and, and the Astros win that game. And then, you know, game two, the Astros, you know, 
but that was a little more competitive than game one, but the Astros were down for a good chunk of that game. And, you know, Jordan Alvarez had another big home run to put them ahead and, and they never lost or and, you know, never trailed after that. And then you think about game three, I mean, that was nothing, nothing for 17 innings. And, you know, obviously one bounce here, you know, one break there, that game could have gone very differently. So I think when you look at that division series and you say, well, the Astros swept them. And I think in, if you don't look at it closely, you think, oh, they must have just dominated the Mariners. Yeah. But that I, I don't think so at all. They played much better in the ALCS against the Yankees than they did in the division series against the Mariners. I remember turning on that 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 game, that 17 inning game and and being, oh, my God. And then seeing that that the relief bring in the reliever and they bring in. And first pitch, and Alvarez hits that home run, and I was like, I can't believe what I, I can't believe I just saw that happen. You know, first pitch. Um, but to segue off the Astros a little bit, um, I do want to talk about Beltran though. Um, again, you know, getting hired by the Mets, do you see like that he might be being groomed to basically be Buck Walter's replacement down the road? I don't know. Um, you know, it's a good question. I mean, obviously, he was the Mets manager for you know, what, a couple of weeks or whatever it was, <laughs> never got to manage a game. Um, I'll say this about Carlos Beltran. He is one of the most respected people in the game in terms of just his knowledge of the game. Um, and granted, I, I haven't spent as much time around him uh, since 2017, the year he was with the Astros, but um, even just talking with people around the game, and I actually did see Carlos, he was – when the Astros played the Yankees in New York, he was doing that series for the Yes Network, and I did get to chat with him, I mean, briefly. But, you know, Carlos has a lot of respect in the game, and I think that's probably still true even after everything that happened with the with the 2017 Astros. You know, that year, I mean, he was like an additional hitting coach. He would tell, He would notice things in batting practice. He would, you know, he'd pick up on stuff. And, I mean, even the hitting coaches on the Astros at the time, I remember them saying to me, you know, Sometimes it's good for Carlos Beltran to say something to a guy that we've been trying to tell them for a while, but they hear it from one of their peers and someone who's so respected and, you know, they're more likely to listen. But yeah, just an incredibly smart, incredibly savvy baseball player. He, you know, can communicate with just about anyone, whether it's a a player from Latin America or, you know, someone who's English speaking, Um, just incredibly smart and and just so well-rounded and and just his knowledge of the game. So I think to have Carlos Beltran in your organization and whatever role it is, I think is only a positive, um, you know, whether he manages, but I, I don't, that I don't know. And I, I, I honestly have no idea what his aspirations might be. I know, you know, he was living in New York for a while in New York city in Manhattan, um, you know, and raising his kids there, but uh, they moved back to Puerto Rico during the pandemic um, so he doesn't live in New York full time. And I'm assuming he isn't still um, with, uh, you know, this new role. I could be wrong, but I mean, that would just be my assumption. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I don't know if, you know, how much that factors into it for him in terms of, you know, how involved he'd want to be day to day with the team. But, you know, when Carlos Beltran would walk into the clubhouse in 2017, it was almost it felt regal. Like there are not too many guys I can say that about when they walk into a clubhouse, it feels like, I mean, it it felt like royalty and it had nothing to do with how he dressed or anything like that. It was just like, it was like the temperature in the room was completely different when Carlos Beltran walked in the room. He didn't have to say anything. He didn't have to do anything. He doesn't walk in and sit down in his locker and the mood changes instantly um, because that's just the sort of presence that he had without even trying. I read an article today um, that basically talked about, talked about that. Right. And, how Francisco Lindor would is when is in a slump and called Carlos Beltran. You know, he has no affiliation with the Mets, right? But he called Carlos Beltran to help him work his way out of a slump. Right. So him and apparently him and Edwin Diaz were pushing the front Mets front office to bring him back to the to the organization to, you know, to in some sort of capacity. Um, he did the same thing with uh Yuli Gurriel. Um mm-hmm. Beltran was working uh I think it was an advisory role with the Yankees at the time of memory serves and Yuli Gurriel was struggling. This was in 2019, I believe. Yes. 2019. And, um, uh, Alex Centron, one of the Astros hitting coaches reached out to Carlos Beltran, um, you know, two obviously know each other very well, both natives of Puerto Rico. And they were both part of that 2017 Astros club. Centron was on that staff and he reached out to Carlos Beltran, basically asked him, Hey, can you, can you just talk to Yuli? And he did. 
And I mean, I'm not going to say that's the only reason Yuli Gurriel kind of got out of his slump that year, but it didn't hurt. No, no, totally. Um, let's segue now just to you, to you personally. Um, you mentioned earlier your grandfather, big baseball fan, um, you know, played, uh, you know, Negro League, minor league baseball. Was he your inspiration to becoming a baseball fan? Was he? Was it your father? How did you? Be, how did you get into into baseball and become such a such a big fan that made you want to go into the career of broadcasting? Yeah, it was my grandfather and it was my my mom's dad and also my dad. Those were the the two biggest reasons that you know I kind of got interested in baseball and and really got became a big sports fan. Um, yeah, I mean, my grandfather he would. Um, it didn't matter if the Mets were. 30 games up or 30 games back. It could be April 2nd or October 2nd. If the Mets were playing a game, especially after my grandfather retired, he was going to make sure he was in his recliner watching that game. He was not missing that game every single day. You know, when both of my grandparents were alive, you know, we'd go over there for Easter and for Mother's Day and Father's Day. And, you know, you think about it. The Fourth of July and all of those those holidays, we'd be over at my grandparents' house, and there'd always be a game on, and my grandfather would be sitting there. Well, on Fourth of July, he would go back to his grill and grill, but he'd have the game on the radio outside, so he wouldn't miss anything. <laughs> of course, but he'd be he, otherwise he'd be in his chair, um, maybe doze off for a second, and it would seem like he wasn't really paying attention to what was going on around him. You know, I mean. Um, there are not that many men on, on my mom's side of the family. My mom uh, has, has two sisters, my two aunts, um, and uh, they all had um, a bunch of girls. Um, and also, too, I'm the oldest grandchild on that side of the family by seven years. So, you know, it'd be my mom, my aunts, my grandmother, all these little girls running around and and me. And, uh, you know, my grandfather would just be sitting there and it wouldn't seem like he's really contributing to conversation or saying anything. Um, but then you, you know, you'd walk and be like, Hey, what's going on in the game? He would tell you how every run scored. He knew exactly what was happening. He's like, I think they need to take this picture out. He's tiring, like whole, whole deal. He, he, he knew he paid attention to everything. He didn't miss a thing. Um, so yeah, he was certainly a big inspiration. And my dad, I watched more baseball with my dad than anybody else. Um, you know, my parents were divorced. I would spend weekends with my dad for, for the most part. And so, yeah, I mean, we, we'd watch baseball. We'd watch whatever sport was in season, but, you know, we were both big Mets fans. Um, you know, baseball was my dad's favorite sport as well. Um, and yeah, we would sit there and we would talk about the game. We would talk about what was going on in the game. We'd also talk about baseball history. And, you know, my dad certainly was into baseball history and, and I got into it as well. And, you know, and then, you know, Ralph Kiner would mention, you know, Ewell Blackwell, who was the toughest pitcher he'd ever faced. My dad wasn't old enough to have seen Ewell Blackwell pitch, but he knew a little bit about him. And we would talk about that or, you know, they'd bring up some other player. Tim McCarver would bring up, you know, some other player he played with or against. And, you know, we would talk about those things. So, yeah, I mean, those those are the two people who are the most responsible for me being as as big into baseball as, as I am, my dad and my grandfather. I heard your um, your story about your first game and your dad, you know, telling you that you couldn't go to the game. If, uh, you know, if you, if you, if you suck your thumb and, and uh, I told the guys, I was like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to use this, I'm going to use this strategy on my son, try to get him to stop <laughs> doing that as well. Cause my, my son is a, uh, a big Brett Beatty fan. We went to go see him play in double A this summer. Cause we live really close to Somerset, New Jersey. And uh, I said to him the other day, I was like, you, Brett Beatty's not going to play if you keep doing that. And he goes, well, it, he goes, it's not baseball season right now. So it doesn't matter. I was like, okay, touche. Can't argue with you on that one, but it's a, it's a, it's a strategy I like, and I'm going to try to use it. Yeah, I mean, it worked on me. I, you know, my dad also told me that the uh, the the stain, the birthmark on Miguel Gorbachev's head, uh, was because Ronald Reagan had spilled wine on him, uh, and um, <laughs> you know, I believe that for for longer than I should have. So that just gives you a window into my to my dad's personality but um yeah i you know dal strawberry was my favorite player um still is my all-time favorite player and yeah my dad told me dal strawberry will not play if he looks in the stands so he's you sucking your thumb because i told i told my dad i want to go to a mets game i want to see dal strawberry um and uh, lo and behold he had a walk-off home run to win the game it was against the reds in april 1985 hit it off of john franco actually who mm. of course later 
you know, had a lot of really good years with the Mets. Um, but yeah, that was the first game I went to. Mets won it two to one, if memory serves. It was Ed Lynch against Tom Browning was the pitching matchup. Wow. wow. What a throwback, a throwback right there. <laughs> the, the, just the names just make me smile. Like they do, yeah. there's nothing better than naming 80s and 90s baseball players. Like I can do that all day. <laughs> What was it like growing up a Mets fan in the Bronx? It was fine. I mean, you know, you get grief for it, but um, it, it really wasn't that big of a deal to me. Um, when I was younger, um, you know, the Mets, that was, you know, I always tell people who aren't from New York, the late 80s, early 90s, the only time in the history of the Mets that they had a bigger following than the Yankees did in New York City. Um, and that's really kind of when I came of age. I mean, I became more into the Mets and more into baseball kind of at the end of that era and really, you know, into the 90s when the Mets weren't as good. But, uh, you know, at that time, I mean, there were a lot of Mets fans everywhere when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, obviously that started to change. And then obviously then the Yankees had their dynasty in the mid late 90s. And, you know, and and, by, and at that point, I mean, you you know, the only Met hat you'd see in the Bronx is mine and maybe my mom's because my mom's a Mets fan <laughs> as well. Um, but, you know, when I uh, got in, when I started fourth grade, I changed elementary schools. Um, I was going to PS 26. We had moved um, and uh, my mom got me in the PS 95. My mom also taught in the district. She never taught. My mom taught at PS 86 in the Bronx. Uh, but we never, I never went to PS 86 where my mom taught. Um, but yeah, so I go to PS 95 and, um, the class I'm in, first of all, I'm, uh, an outsider. Most, most of these kids have been together since kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Um, and they were a pretty tight knit group and, um, there weren't that many boys. I think in a class of, you know, 30 to 35, um, there were like, I think it was like 10 to 12 boys. So not, you know, it was overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly girls. And um, the boys were all huge sports fans and particularly huge baseball fans. And they were all big Yankees fans. And um, here I come. I'm this kid they don't know. Um, and there's this kind of close knit group of boys who always played sports together during recess and all these things. And here I come from somewhere else, and now I'm a, I'm a Mets fan. And, you know, and this was, you know, I started fourth grade. This would have been fall of 1988. And um, so, you know, the Mets, you know, they, you know, they went to the playoffs that year. And they accused me of being a front runner because the other part of it was, at that point, I, I considered myself a baseball fan and a Mets fan. I knew baseball was my favorite sport, but I really hadn't been following it all that closely at that point. You know, I kind of passively watch games with my dad or whatever, but I, I really didn't pay close attention. Um, and so then I show up, I'm a Mets fan. They start asking me basic questions about the Mets. I don't know the answers to them. I didn't know who Keith Hernandez played for before he came to the Mets, for instance. Um, and so they're like, oh, you're just a front runner. You just like the Mets because they're good. You know anything about the Mets. So, you know, this pissed me off. And so I didn't want to be embarrassed. And so that's really when I started to really get into baseball and to really following it closely. And I was always an avid reader growing up. So, you know, I just started reading about baseball and, you know, that's really when I started to learn about the history of the game and all that, but it, it really started with me not wanting to be embarrassed. Um, and cause you know, these kids couldn't believe, you know, here I am, I grew up and I'm growing up in the Bronx and I'm a, I'm, I'm not a Yankees fan. Of course the Yankees were not very good at that time. Uh, certainly not compared to the Mets, but, uh, you know, they were they were loyal Yankees fans, but I, I, I was not. But it also, you know, it lit a fire under me. And I don't know that I'd be sitting here without that experience. What books did you read that that you still recall uh, to this day? Um, I remember my dad getting me like just kind of like a basic baseball book, like just a basic, you know, simple like history book, mm -hmm. more or less geared toward kids, just about the basics of the game. Um I would read, you know, they back then, they, I don't know that they really do this as much anymore. You know how they come out with those season preview magazines like Street yeah. and Smith's mm -hmm. and yeah. um, Bill Mazeroski baseball. And um, they come out with little paperback books as well. I remember I, I devoured those. Um, it was, a, you know, a lot of stuff like that. Um, 
I remember in the, in the, in the class library, we had, um, books that were like, you know, greatest baseball moments. And there would be like a chapter about, you know, the 1975 world series mm -hmm. or, you know, a chapter about, uh, you know, Don Larson's perfect game, for instance, or things like that. So, you know, I would just devour anything I can get my hands on about baseball. Um, and, uh, so, you know, and then later on, as I got older, you know, when I was in middle school, you know, my mom got me a subscription to sports illustrated, and, you know, would read that. And, um, you know, my parents, whether I was at my mom's house or my dad's house on Sunday, the Sunday New York times is always a staple. And so I would, I would read the sports section. Like, you know, I, my, you know, my mom would send me to go buy the paper. I bring the paper back. And before I hand it to my mom, I take the sports section out and, and go to my, go to my bedroom. Then my mom would get, get annoyed at me. Like, are you, are you, are you, are you done with this? Like, I actually want to read the the paper that I bought too. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a lot of stuff like that, um, you know, that, that I read and, you know, that, that helped, helped me uh, learn more about, about the game. And that was Robert Ford. And this interview was so spectacular that, we've made this decision to cut it in half uh, and we're going to air part two of our interview with Robert Ford coming up tomorrow. So stay tuned. It's going to be, it's going to be in your feed before you know it, but uh, in the meantime, please check out our website, throwingbagels.com. Uh, we have past episodes are up there right now. Uh, you can also listen to us wherever you listen to your podcasts uh, at this point uh, at our Twitter feed, our, our Facebook page. You can get to those from our page as well. And if you have any questions, uh, certainly feel free to reach out to us anytime, throwingbagels at gmail.com. And we will pick things up with Houston Astros radio voice, Robert Ford, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs>